The end was near. Winter finally caught up with us as we turned into the home stretch of our journey, bringing not only the seasonal nostalgia of summertime, but reflections of a grand adventure approaching its conclusion. We seized each final endeavor knowing that all too soon our time in the North would be up. The temperature was now regularly below freezing as October was rolling around on the Cassier Highway. At the southern end, we made the turn onto British Columbia Highway 16 that would next take us to Prince George. We were no longer in the remote reaches of the north and farms and developed areas dotted the landscape here. Shortly after turning west, we decided to take a detour through a small group of towns known as the Hazeltons. These towns are located in the amazingly beautiful Bulkley River Valley that was accented by high peaks. The road out to the towns first crosses the Bulkley River on an amazing one-lane suspension bridge 262 feet above the water. The town of Hazleton is known as the totem capital of the world, with more than 50 authentic totem poles in its vicinity. These artistic structures have many meanings and uses that vary as much as the cultures that craft them, and this area is rich in native First Nations culture that these totems represent. Our next stop was a few hours down the road at the town of Burns Lake. As we had heard, this town has great mountain biking. A short way outside town, we found the Kager Lake Bike Park, and to our surprise, they had a newly developed, donation-based dry campground right at the trailhead. We had filled and dumped our tanks at the Hazelton's Visitor Center, so we decided to settle in here. While we had used our bikes a lot on this trip, we had not been on any dedicated mountain bike single track, so after tuning up our rides, we hit the trails. This entire facility turned out to be amazing with so many well-developed trails and fun structures. While we are not avid bikers, we had a blast riding around here and found all the locals we came across very friendly and open to having visitors, as this park was built by the local biking community and is maintained by volunteers. The next morning, we awoke to plummeting temperatures. It's snowing! We were kind of hoping that this would happen sometime during this trip, and it's, it's happening. It's the first snow. The first snow is always so magical. But we'll probably have to start heading south here very soon. <laughs> Temperatures continued to drop and wet ground turned to ice, making biking no longer possible. So instead we went for a hike and watched the magic of this first snow turn the world around us white.
was left in the campground, and we were in no rush. So we decided to stay put for a few more days, testing out our home on wheels in this excessive cold. Our trial Truma furnace was running a lot, but we were staying comfortably warm. We were also monitoring our battery install temperatures, as if the battery temperatures dropped below 25 degrees, we would not be able to charge them until they warmed. Amazingly, even with temperatures 20 degrees below freezing, bleed heat from the furnace was keeping our batteries around 40 degrees Fahrenheit. started to warm, we decided it was time to move on. We were on our way to Prince George, but made one more stop in the town of Vanderhoof along the Nechaco River to visit the Nechaco White Sturgeon Conservation Center. Here we learned about the incredible white sturgeon that is Canada's largest freshwater fish and has been around since the time of the dinosaurs. These fish are critically endangered as they have failed to continue spawning in the rivers and without help will likely go extinct. The reason for their decline is not fully understood, but it seems to be a combination of dams silting the rivers, pollution, and declining food supply from human activities in the region. This facility was very modern with impressive water management and automation, and our guide gave us an excellent tour. This center's mission is to stabilize the fish population through its hatchery, researching reasons for spawning failure in the wild, and putting corrections in place to return the sturgeon to a self-sustaining population. From here, we headed to the last destination of our trip, Prince George, British Columbia. Most of our adventures on this trip had been in the wilds of the north and small towns, but here at the end of our trip, we decided to take a few days of full hookups at a campground and have one last hoorah exploring this northerly town we knew nothing about. As with most of our trip, we started out at the visitor center to learn what there is to see and do in the area and plan out the last of this trip's adventures. Quite a rack. <laughs> over the next few days, the weather was going to be all over the place with spells of cold and rain. We took the rainy days to explore the town's indoor activities, starting with their exploration center. Today we are at the exploration place here in Prince George. It's a science, cultural, and history center. So let's go check it out. This facility offers so many educational science exhibits, along with a museum covering history of the town and the First Nations cultures. <laughs> Here we learn that Prince George has been a manufacturing center over the years, along with heavy involvement in the lumber industry. The town is very proud of its lumber roots, and even has a large wooden man statue called Mr. PG that welcomes visitors. During the rainy days, we also explored the downtown, doing a little shopping and sampling the local cuisine, like wood-fired pizza, gourmet Mediterranean food, and great craft beers. Yeah, it's good. We toured one of the breweries that had recently opened in the location of an old car dealership and enjoyed learning about the modern brewing process and tasting these so craft beers of the north. That's not good. That's no good, isn't it? 
When the weather broke, we also visited a few parks of the town, such as Cottonwood Island. Walking through the towering cottonwood trees, we kept our eyes out for the carvings we had been told about. So we're down here exploring the Cottonwood Island Park in Prince George, and aside from having beautiful trails and these old growth cottonwood trees, an artist has been carving faces and really unique things into just the bark on the outside of these trees since 2005. And it's kind of like a scavenger hunt walking through here and finding all these beautiful carvings. Prince George is located at the confluence of two rivers, the mighty Fraser River that has provided transport over the years to the Pacific Ocean, and the Nechaco River that flows from the coastal mountain range. Across the Nechaco River from town, we visited the Northern Lights Estate Winery. We enjoy tasting wines as we travel, and this is British Columbia's most northern winery. Due to the latitude of the winery, all their wines are fruit-based, but grown right on site. Apricot mush. <laughs> Being so far north, grapes don't do well, but during our tasting, we found many of these wines as desirable as some of our favorite varietals, and we left with a few bottles. With weather improving, we took the visitor center recommendations and went for a few hikes in the area, like up Teapot Mountain. So we've driven north out of Prince George. We took some forest roads out here to Teapot Mountain that you can hike around and up to the top. The hike up this 650 foot volcanic outcropping turned out very steep and was challenging on the wet and icy ground. So parts of this trail are like going straight out the mountain. It's warming us up, which is good, because it's a chilly day. <laughs> this is the only tall peak for miles around, and the trail rings around the top of the mountain, providing 360 degree views. We also explored another area we had wanted to see on our way north in the spring, that was now closer to our spot in Prince George, the ancient forest. This is an old growth forest of western red cedars that happens to be further north and from the coast than any other rainforest in the world. The unique geography here has allowed these trees to grow for over 1,000 years to immense sizes. So we're really thankful that these boardwalks have shingles nailed down so that you're not slipping all over the place. Otherwise, it would be very slippery. But this is an incredible hike. These trees are over a thousand years old, a lot of them, and we're used to seeing rainforests on the coasts, uh, but to see one inland like this is really, really, really neat. These trees are so beautiful. Being a rainforest, the cold, wet weather was expected and gave us a magical feeling of walking amongst these ancient giants. We happened to be in the area during Canada's Thanksgiving on the second Monday in October and decided to make a visit to the Hubble Homestead Historic Site for Thanksgiving festivities. Today is Thanksgiving here in Canada, and like the United States, they celebrate by giving thanks and celebrating the harvest. So we've come out to the Hubble Homestead where they're having some old-fashioned Thanksgiving festivities at this heritage site, and we're gonna go check it out. The living history display gave us a sense of stepping back in time as we were given a tour of the grounds. Built in the early 1900s, this homestead continues to represent the early settlers of the region. Located on the banks of the Fraser River, this location was used as a portage for those looking to travel north by the water route from the Pacific Ocean. As at this location, a short seven mile overland trail got early explorers to the next river that eventually flowed to the Arctic Ocean. Although it was cold, we enjoyed the festivities, animals, and a Thanksgiving bite to eat. A 
Our very last adventure was one Kate had been looking forward to all summer. We are at El Shaddai Ranch about to embark on our final adventure here in Prince George and in the north. We're gonna go horseback riding and I'm particularly excited about this. <laughs> In the past, Kate has owned horses, and we try to go horseback riding when we can. After a little bit of instruction, our guide Sean helped us mount our horses, and we headed off for a sunset trail ride. Sean took us out into a large windswept field, and even with the cloudy fall day, the soft light of sunset made for a beautiful ride. Because of all the wet weather, the trails were not in great shape, but it was amazing to see how these powerful animals could take us just about anywhere through the mud and woods, and gave me an understanding and respect of how early transport through the undeveloped wilds was done. What did you think of the ride? Oh, it was wonderful. It didn't rain on us, it stayed warm out, and the horses were great. The trail was great. It was just great. Beautiful. The horseback ride was a little surreal for me because it was really the last big thing we had scheduled before we basically made our way to the border and crossed back into the U.S. So not only was it something that I had been really looking forward to doing this whole entire trip, whether it was in Alaska or Canada, but it ended up being the very last thing that we did and that just made it really special. The next day we packed up and we started our drive south. We still had quite a ways to go before we hit the U.S. border because British Columbia is a huge province. We were only about midway down, so we had a lot of miles to go still. As we drove, we went through some beautiful terrains, mountains and incredible valleys with huge rivers going through it. We even drove through a desert at one point, a desert in British Columbia. We're definitely gonna have to come back. We just simply didn't have the time to explore everything this time. As we got closer to the US border, we honestly got pretty excited since we had pretty much gotten out of adventure mode and into getting home mode, we were really looking forward to being back in the U.S., being back in familiar territory, driving roads that we were familiar with, and ultimately making it home to our fifth wheel. When we crossed the border back into the U.S., it was a strange sensation. It was a bit of culture shock, truthfully, just because it was so busy. And even in southern Canada, uh, it was just so busy from what we'd been used to all summer. We hadn't seen any more than a four-lane road, and now all of a sudden we were in Seattle, and it was just, it was so incredibly different from the north. But we were on familiar roads, we knew all these roads, so driving all the way back down to Lancaster where our fifth wheel was, was pretty easy. Our last night in the truck camper was spent in Alabama Hills, which was extremely fitting because that was where we spent our very first night of this adventure in the truck camper. Getting back to the fifth wheel was like coming home. It really felt like being home again. It was interesting to see the dog's recognition. Actually, they had a little bit of challenge kind of getting used to it initially. They were so used to the truck camper and the small space and they were weirded out for a few days, but once they warmed back up as well, they went right back to their old, their old spots, their old beds and settled back in nicely. Once we were able to open the fifth wheel up, I think we all got in there, us and the dogs included, and we all laid in the on the floor in the living room with our arms outstretched going, oh my gosh, there's so much space in here. It was definitely a tangle of emotions moving back into the fifth wheel just because it represented the end. It was the end of a chapter in our lives, six months of amazing adventures. I think I'm definitely going to miss the truck camper. We got used to it. We adjusted our lifestyle and how we moved around in there to fit the truck camper. And it was actually much easier than I think either of us expected. It suited all of our needs. We were able to cook, we were able to take showers, use the bathroom, go to sleep, work, relax, all of those things. And everything worked really well. I'm also going to miss how easy it was to drive. 
I did a lot of the driving over the summer and I don't feel that confident in the fifth wheel. So being able to drive a rig by myself and be able to go places and take it places, that was very liberating to me. And I, I'm gonna definitely miss that. Picking a favorite thing that we did is almost impossible because so much of our adventure was just incredible. The Arctic Ocean, I would say, was, was a highlight. It, it, it's something that I couldn't even have ever imagined driving to in the past, let alone camping on or swimming in. And while it really is just a body of water, the culture and the remoteness of it, it was such a special place and such a amazing feeling to stand there at the edge of the world where so few people make it and so few people live. As for me, I had all the boxes checked this summer. The mountains, the wildlife, the bears, the moose, the glaciers. We hiked up some amazing glaciers, jet skied to glaciers, helicoptered over glaciers. The mountains were incredible. We saw Denali, just all of the scenery far exceeded what I thought we would experience. With any trip of this size, there definitely are gonna be challenges, and we had a few. Our awning came out on the road while we were heading north of Jasper National Park. Luckily, that was an easy fix. We ran into the porcupines on Canole Road, which could have been a real nightmare. Thankfully, Tom jerry-rigged the truck back together. Just the endurance for a six-month trip like this, there was the fatigue definitely took a toll on us at times and we had to take days to just take some downtime just because we were having adventure after adventure. The roads were actually better than I expected them to be based on all of the horror stories. Just go slow, be prepared for the worst. It's a long way so if your tires are needing to be changed, change them before you go. But I wouldn't let that scare you. I really wouldn't because the reward, once you get up there, is so worth it. A highlight of this trip was definitely the people that we met along the way. The people that we met really helped enhance our experience, sharing stories, sharing places that they'd been, and they were so warm, so welcoming. We just had a great time getting to meet some of these people that without going there, we never would have. Would I recommend going north to Alaska? Absolutely. It was the trip of a lifetime, and I think it has changed us in ways we don't even realize yet. If you can drive to Alaska, I'd say do it. It's an amazing experience, but take your time. Take your time through Canada. Take as much time as you can and enjoy it. Reflecting on this trip, we have realized that time was the biggest limiting factor. With the summer season so short and the area to be explored so vast, we were constantly wishing for more time. We also realized, however, that no matter where you go or how you spend your time, amazing adventures await. Each journey teaches us something new and helps us develop a respect and understanding of places and cultures outside what we are used to. By the end of our trip, we had covered nearly 15,000 miles and completed the biggest journey of our lives thus far. In the final days, we found ourselves lost in thoughts and memories of the past six months and realizing that this adventure would have an impact on the rest of our lives. We had found that in Alaska and northern Canada, the wilderness holds dominion over the land, weaving itself into everyday life and continuing to lure explorers like us to go north.